Hi, welcome to Culturally Determined on Blogging Heads TV. I'm your host, Arya Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Daniel Vesner. Daniel, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel Vesner, and I'm the Pyle Assistant Professor uh, in the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, so we have two topics today, and the first one is going to be um, kind of... Uh, the cultural meaning of Jeffrey Epstein and what we're learning about him, uh, what, what, you know, how it's making us, uh, reevaluate what we know about the ruling class. And basically, uh, so I was, you know, I've been kind of fascinated by this case as many people are. And, um, I wanted to talk about it to someone on, blo- on blogging heads. And I was thinking like, you know, I consider myself a liberal or possibly even a, a neoliberal that hate, much hated term. And, you know, if there's, like, I think this story is maybe making me think like, okay, we have to burn it all down. Like the system is just corrupt to its very core. And, you know, because the, like Epstein, you know, he's, he has his tentacles in a lot of different right. um, parts of elite institutions that uh, run our country bi- the world. So he's a truly bipartisan person. <laughs> yeah. So just to, you know, review for people who haven't been paying super attention, uh, Epstein was at, at least, uh, friends with Bill Clinton um, and seems to have visited actually Clinton in the white house before, you know, it seemed like at one point he was just in his post-presidential phase, Bill was flying around on Epstein's private jet. Um, but it seems like they have more contact than that. And also uh, close friends with Donald Trump. Um, and the connections to Trump are more extensive, at least the publicly known ones are more extensive than to Clinton. Um, the uh, article that's kind of infamous at this point, because it uh, that was published in New York Magazine, I think, in 2002, or maybe it was Vanity Fair in 2002. Anyway, it was a profile of Epstein um, before he was convicted of, you know, his, like, or pled guilty to, like, his charge of prostitution. Um, and there was a quote from Trump saying, oh, he's a great guy, and he loves women almost as much as I do, and they say he loves young women, especially. Um, right. And there's also just like weird connections, like uh, the the article that broke open the rebroke open the scandal in the Miami Herald um, focused on a young woman who happened to work at Mar-a-Lago and was recruited um, from Mar-a-Lago to uh, you know give massages at Epstein's estate. So then, right. so yes, there's, there's those shockingly strange connections between two of the last four presidents, and then there's also all this stuff about his connections to uh, the world of academia and philanthropy. Um, and all the, um, you know, public intellectuals and scientists who kind of hobnob with him and would would take his money, and, and particularly Harvard. Yeah. So and, like, and as Epstein, an institution, Harvard more yeah, than anyone. He gave money to Harvard. Apparently, he gave less than he promised, but he did did give a couple million dollars to Harvard. He would yeah. wear like Harvard t shirts and sweatshirts around, even though he uh, didn't even graduate from college. And uh, in particular, had a lot of uh, connections to uh, people at the faculty. The Harvard faculty, like Alan Dershowitz, uh, who was charged by one woman with um, uh, having underage sex with her at Epstein's estate, which which he denies. And then connections, I think uh, Lauren Summers was someone he was pals with uh, for president of Harvard and Steven Pinker, um, who was at least photographed one time at one of uh, Epstein's little kind of, um, you know, conference type things that he would hold. And... Uh, Pinker uh, responded. I, I, I took out this quote, and this is one of the things I thought was was interesting. Um, so, so Pinker responded in um, a blog post uh, that was posted on uh, "Why Evolution Is True," which is not his blog, but someone else's blog. And so, this is the quote from Stephen Pinker, a renowned linguist and Harvard professor. Uh, the annoying irony is that I could never stand the guy, never took research funding for, from him, and always tried to keep my distance. Friends and colleagues described him to me as a quanti- quantitative genius and a scientific sophisticate, and they invited me to, to salons and coffee clutches at which he held court. But I found him to be a kibitzer and a dilettante. He would abruptly change the subject ADD style, dismiss an observation with an adolescent wisecrack, and privilege his own intuitions over systematic data. I think the dislike was mutual. According to a friend, he, quote, voted me off the island, presumably because he was sick of me trying to keep the conversation on track and correcting him when he shot off his mouth on topics he knew nothing about. Um, yeah, so... I mean, there's an irony in the voting off the island, considering he, uh, Epstein owns a private island. So that might be literal. Uh, you know, you have to leave this island now. But, you know, I just like what is, you know, Stephen Pinker, one of the leading 
public intellectuals. He opines on all sorts of stuff, uh, you know, way beyond his uh, expertise in linguistics. You know, he's written these books, Enlightenment Now and The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, human progress is going along uh, swimmingly and all this stuff. And in his spare time, he's at the coffee clutches in the salons. And who is, you know, who like who's there? It's just this guy who has a lot of money. Um, and no one really knows where the money came from. He's like a hedge fund guy or something. But, uh, you know, he commands the room and he can uh, set yeah. the subject and he can, um, you know, he's arguing with Pinker and, and so forth. And eventually Pinker stops going, not because, you know, this is all bullshit or something, but because Epstein doesn't want him there anymore. Um, right. And what was Pinker getting out of this? I mean, he was hanging out with other like high flying intellectual academic types, I guess, and maybe other rich people were there as well. And yeah, I don't know. There's something. So even if you don't consider Epstein, like take that, yeah. take out the fact that Epstein is a serial uh, sexual predator. Like there's just something gross about this, that the, you know, the intellectuals and the, uh, the rich people are just, you know, lounging about in like a <laughs> Paris salon style and using on whatever. And then there's also the story that came out a couple of days ago. That was re that was really crazy. In the New York Times headline, Jeffrey Epstein hoped to seed human race with his DNA. An also right. great headline, you have to say, in the Times, because seed was meant literally. He wanted to build this, he wanted to impregnate like hundreds of women with his uh, semen so that little genius Jeffrey Epstein children could repopulate the earth or something like that. So, yeah, so this guy is, is and, and a lot of other, other prominent scientists are mentioned in this, in this article, including a lot of people who have appeared on Blogging Heads over the years. Pinker has been on Blogging Heads. Um, Jaron Lanier has been on blog a couple times, uh, Lawrence Krauss, who was in that aforementioned photograph with Pinker and Epstein and has had his own uh, troubles with accusations of sexual impropriety over the past couple of years. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I've, I've laid out a lot here. What, I mean, what, what do you think about all this? Well, there's, there's a lot that that's going on in everything that you laid out and everything in this case. Uh, I mean, just from academia, it shows what happens when public funding goes away, uh, on one hand, and then on the other hand, when universities become essentially, I think the famous line uh, about Harvard is a hedge fund with a university attached, <laughs> right? When they become organized um, through various processes of administrative bloat uh, and the rise of administration and the rise of university endowments that are never used, they become organized essentially around making friends with incredibly wealthy plutocrats who are then able to use their money to buy the social prestige that comes along with hanging out with people like like Steven Pinker or, or Alan Dershowitz. And it'll actually be interesting to me to see if Harvard as an institution begins to suffer some sort of um, blow to its prestige, just given what happened with Epstein, but also what happened with that article in New York Magazine about the Harvard law professor who was essentially bilked by the woke grifters right. uh, and also things related to, to Mark Zuckerberg. So it'll be interesting to see if this institution that historically stands at the apex of American prestige, particularly in academia takes a hit and if it doesn't i think that 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 that, that says a lot and then maybe we should talk uh talk about that but i think it's also related to what universities have become in terms of that um element but also related to that is the fact that if you read the new york magazine i think it's from 2003 or maybe even 2004 one of the first paragraphs, maybe even the first paragraph, it essentially says Epstein is a genius. He's, you know, equivalent to a Nobel Prize winning scientist because he made a lot of money on Wall Street. So I think what, what this story also shows is sort of the, the, the cultural position that someone like Epstein held before the Great Recession of 2008. Um, you went to Yale in the mid 2000s, I went to Columbia in the mid 2000s, and I'm sure we both had similar experiences about the most prestigious thing that someone could become it was not a physicist like it was in the 1950s, for example, or it wasn't a historian, definitely not a historian, <laughs> or a, a sort of a, a public figure like yourself on Blocking Heads, but it was someone. <laughs> well, that's who, a, that's a bit much. You, you, you couldn't become a podcaster when I graduated because yes, they didn't, it didn't really well, exist yet. <laughs> Yeah, just yet. But it was on the way. Bill Simmons was, I think, like kind of – but anyway. But um, but you, you, you saw the incredible cultural pos uh, position that being a banker was, right? That it's particularly in, in the northeast corridors that you and I were a part of, um, it was really the most prestigious thing that, that someone was able to become. And I think there was this whole cultural world, particularly in New York where I was, when, when to be rich was to be venerated in a real way. And I think that the, the pre-2008 Epstein, which is what we're returning to now in a post-2008 lens, it really rings 
something strange. When you return to all of these articles and these sort of masters of the universe are treated as Nobel Prize uh, equivalent geniuses, it, it just reads sort of odd because there's so much more of a skepticism of finance and of banking after 2008 than there was before 2008. So I think there's also a really interesting cultural change that is reflected in that shift. And there's another thing that I think, uh, which is also interesting about Epstein, which is relates to this notion of meritocracy. Um, particularly Epstein, I believe, came from Coney Island, uh, which is actually near where I grew up in Rockaway, Queens. People like Alan Dershowitz was also, you know, grew up in middle class. Alan Dershowitz got his BA from Brooklyn College. I believe he went to Yale Law, um, but he got his BA from Brooklyn College. And Epstein, as you said, never actually, um, finished college, even though he taught at Dalton, I think. He was teaching physics at Dalton while getting on. Yeah, there's, there's so many strange little details that you feel like there's another fact out there that needs to be explained. Yeah, how did a guy who didn't actually have a BA get to teach at one of the elite uh, private schools, which and which in a which is something that seems like only a coincidence, was run at the time by the father of William Barr, right. the current attorney general. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I don't feel like this is just... You know, there's always and, something and you lost s- out there, or, or, or what is, I don't know what the explanation of is. And it's just another, to me, an, another of the many nails in the coffin of meritocracy, right? Where, where you see that this ideology that has really organized the American elite since 1945, I think it's really fair to say 1945, uh, it, it's, it's really just, not, not operating and I would almost say never operated in the way that it was supposed to. So you have an entire social logic that is coming crashing down, not only with the failures of things like Iraq, which was supported by many experts or the Great Recession, which was not foreseen by most economists, um, but also with these sorts of r- r- radically disgusting actions that someone like Epstein takes. You have this whole cultural edifice and this organizing principle, this organizing logic of meritocracy. Uh, is really coming apart. And so I think this is a, a really interesting moment because there's no logic to really replace it. Right. The idea that inequality was essentially justified because the people who earned money got it through merit is coming apart with the increasing recognition that capitalism tends to lead to these enormous inequalities. The problem is, is that there's no alternative social logic really to replace it. There's uh, elements and there's a burgeoning socialism, but it's, in my opinion, very burgeoning and very nascent. There is not decades of theorizing of how to organize society, uh, a society like the United States in 2019 along more socialistic or or more among more egalitarian lines. So you have the collapse of one organizing logic and there's no organizing logic to replace it. And I think this is why Epstein is really getting the, um, so much attention because there's so much embodied in his fall that you could really use it to talk about a variety of different topics. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it's interesting to think about Epstein as a a meritocrat. Yeah. So he comes out of borough, Kind of, yeah, Coney Island. Um, as bridge and tunnel as one could possibly be. <laughs> okay, well, still, while still being within the uh, city of yeah. New York. And I assume attended public schools in New York City, although I, I actually don't know about that. Um, he attended Lafayette High School, where my grandmother graduated from. <laughs> oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. And then, like, from the, okay, so from the outside, it does seem like, well, he's a self-made man. Like, he somehow, like hustled and got a job at Dalton, even though he didn't deserve it. It's, it's almost like a Horatio Alger story. And, right. then, and then he, um, so he like, he's tutoring the, the son of a wall street person. I think that's how he gets the job at Bear Stearns. And as we all remember, Bear Stearns, his collapse, uh, instigated the financial crisis. And, and then he's there for a long time. And it does seem like he is, um, successful in like bond trading, or whatever exactly currency trading he w- he was doing and then goes off on his own and starts his own hedge fund. And then he, he has this meeting with this guy, uh, Les Wexner, who right. is the founder of, um, co- uh, comp- I think it's called the L company or something like that, but it, it, it it's the, the limited. company. It, yeah. It's the parent company of the limited and, um, Victoria's Victoria secret. Yeah. So a very wealthy guy who, you know, has a successful retail empire selling clothing and, then he becomes basically like the personal like financial advisor to this guy, but more like his personal like financial agent. Like he, he like Wexner somehow signs over the uh, like legal right that uh, Epstein can sign uh, legal documents in his name and, and uh, has like complete control over his finances. He gets this uh, massive 
apartment apartment in Manhattan that is possibly the largest uh, residential, so like single apartment in Manhattan that once belonged to Wexner and, and Epstein like moves in there and then eventually like takes it over and it, so that he owns it. So yeah, it, he it, creates like evil billionaire things like having a chessboard with pieces dressed like his staff. I mean, it's it's really all, all sort yeah, lots of weird shit, but really. Bizarre. Okay, so on the outside, it seems like this guy is just great at what he does and has, you know, manipulating uh, money and foreseeing where the market's going to go and blah, blah, and rises up. But then the more you learn about it, it's, it's like uh, other potential theories come to mind. There was one that someone on Twitter linked to, uh, linked to soon after he was arrested that is seems crazy at first, but, the, but then kind of does fit the facts of like, uh, you know, Epstein wasn't like – he wasn't like a pimp who was – running a um you know who was pimping out young women to rich men he was an extortion artist who was entrapping young men who had a predilection for young women and then forcing them to invest his money their money with him and then that would be a way to kind of like launder extortion payments by making it look like it's the standard you know two and twenty that the um that the hedge fund manager gets to take from the profits of uh, you know, the rich person whose money he's, he's managing. Uh, so that seems kind of, kind of crazy and something out of like a, a, a movie, but it does kind of fit the facts. And yeah. So, so, you know, the, this is the, the meritocrat and Horatio Alger. It seems like there's so many strange things that happened in his story that you, and we know that he was uh, allegedly uh, abusing, you know, hundreds of, of young women, uh, like in an insatiable way that he, um, it's like what what the fuck was actually going on here? How did he how did he get a billion dollars? There are there are other weird facts like he said his company right. employed 150 people, maybe it only employed 20 people. Were they actually doing any work at all? Where was the, the like there? This doesn't seem like it's a uh, Bernie Madoff kind of Ponzi scheme, but where yeah, were the pro- where are the profits actually coming from? There's there's so many weird unanswered questions here that uh yeah, but none of you know, all the questions none of the I don't think any of the answers are going to be good for you know free market capitalisms of, of boosters right. I mean the mechanics the mechanics of the grift are going to come out over the next year or two as investigative reporters and and discovery happens in legal and and in courts and stuff and I think we'll we'll get the, the 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 details of the grift but I think it just shows that in this particular system uh people are going to organize themselves in a particular way in order to accrue as much financial wealth as possible and they're going to use that for corrupt purposes right and the most interesting thing to me and many, many people have made this point is that the QAnon was right, but they were wrong about the details. Yes. Essentially. And so what does that say? I mean, what does that say? So 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 you, you described yourself as, as a neoliberal. Why this? That's what's interesting to me. Why is this the turning point as opposed to Iraq or as opposed to the Great Recession or as opposed to Obama refusing to jail bankers or as opposed to Donald Trump? What is the symbolic importance of this particular person that this is what I find really interesting, right? The cultural salience of the uh, salience of the, of the Jeffrey Epstein case. And I'm just curious uh, as yeah, someone I, who I, I don't, I, mean, I don't know exactly. I mean, I mean, part of it is like the, you know, personal like revulsion and moral um, horror of like luring constantly um, young women from unstable family situations into your house so that you could rape them. Uh, like right. that, you know, that's like, obviously <laughs> invading Iraq is bad and, and worse because hundreds of thousands of people died. But, you know, this is like, I know there's something almost, um, fairy tale like in the, you know, the, the like older lecher who's like luring the innocent young maidens into, into his house so he can defile them. So that's part of it. I mean, and also like, you know, all of the, um, high flying people who are wrapped up in this, um, you know, I never like, I, like, I didn't agree. I don't know. I mean, since me too, we've learned that a lot of powerful men out there are actually sexual predators, and um, you know, people who, like, I knew who Harvey Weinstein was because I vaguely followed entertainment news. Didn't I? I didn't really know anything about it personally. You know, except people like said he was an asshole. Um, but you know, it was an open secret in Hollywood that he uh, abused women and raped women and so forth. And you know, Cosby. Um, is another, is another such figure where it kind of was like an open secret. Um, right. so yeah, just a, you know, like, I never had any great affection for Alan Dershowitz, but, um, you know, did you receive his book, The Case for Israel, at some point? No, I, every, I never did. <laughs> every, every Jew of my generation, so many, I, I remember I do remember, I got the, I do remember that book coming out. Yeah, I never, yeah. I never like really cared for him, but I don't know. It's just like that he is so, yeah, that he is so enmeshed in this, 
And then I guess to, just to bring up, this is the thing I was kind of like joking with privately because it is, I think it is kind of touchy. It's like, you know, is this, is this, is the Epstein story like the, um, like sexual protocols of the elders of Zion? Because a lot of Jewish men are wrapped up in this story. And yeah. uh, Epstein, of course, is Jewish. Uh, Dershowitz is Jew- Jewish. I believe Pinker is. Um, and uh, Wexner is Jewish and is, is a big supporter of pro-Israel causes. Um, yeah. And so obviously like uh, Clinton and, and Trump are not. Um, but it, it, there does seem to be a, like a like Jewish uh, angle to this story. And um, I'm sure there are people it's, on the alt-right who are, who are celebrating this because there's this old uh, stereotype of, yeah, like the sexually, you know, th- there's two Jewish male stereotypes. One is like the Woody Allen ineffectual nebbish. And then the other is like the rapacious Jewish man who wants to defile the Gentile women. Um, of course, and, Woody Allen is himself. <laughs> but yeah, Woody Allen turns out to allegedly be the uh, both of them, I guess, I guess at once. Um, and, you know, Weinstein Jewish, of course, no, no, no connection to this case that we know. Although it wouldn't be surprising, I guess, at this point, if there was some Weinstein connection that came out on this. I mean, to me, this has almost – this is, has very little to do with Jewishness per se and more to do with the fact that, that um, these people happen to be in industries where there's enormous hierarchies of power. Um, finance, uh, politics, and entertainment, which in which there is enormous disparity between winners and losers, and any sort of political economic industry that that organizes resources in that way is going to lend itself to abuses of power. That's ultimately what I think it is. Again, it comes back to sort of the hierarchies ne- uh, inevitably engendered by a capitalist political economy, and particularly in the, these particular industries. Um, moreover, that they're concentrated in. New York and Hollywood, which is where the media is centered. I'm sure if one did an investigation of corporate boardrooms that were dominated more by non-Jewish people, one would find similar uh, examples of impropriety. They just haven't been investigated as much. That that's that would be my guess. Mm-hmm. And this uh, this is uh, almost nothing to do with Jewishness. Uh, and more to do again with these sorts of hierarchies of power. That that is that is my guess. Uh, but it is. I mean, it's clear that 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 uh, the people who have gotten most attention have, have very unfortunately been Jewish, and I think it lends itself to sort of anti-Semitic um, accusations, like like you said, sort of a sexual uh, sexual elders of Zion. But again, I think you know if the uh, amount of money spent in, in investigative reporting other industries, I think you'd find very very similar thing: abuses of of, of um, executive assistants, uh, abuses. Mm-hmm. Of who are in lower positions, you know, it's not like corporate boardrooms are, are, are free of patriarchy, you know, or hierarchy. And I just think this has to, happens to be a peculiar um, function of, of where the attention on the investigations have been, particularly starting in the entertainment industry, um, which it uh, and then exploded from there. Yeah, that, I guess that makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't see anything <laughs> in Judaism or being a Jewish man that, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for that, you know, would push one towards sexual depravity uh, as, no, as opposed to no. any other, any other um, ethnicity or religion in America. Um, and yeah, there's a, you know, there's been a number, you know, I think R. Kelly was just, uh, just pled not guilty in court today. Um, you know, there's the right, it's a men, men all over. Are, yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, so I mean, yeah, this it's, is... it's a power problem and it's a men problem. Um, I think, I think some people kind of deny that it's like, they want to look more at the power stuff and less at the men stuff. I think you like the uh, message is pretty key. There's occasionally <laughs> stories involving women abusing their power. The uh, Avital uh, Ronell. Yeah. Uh, uh, that Avital story. And so the, the Amy Heckerling and Chris Kattan, do you remember that one? I don't remember that. that. I believe uh, Amy Hecker. Uh, not, do you remember that classic 1998 night at the Roxbury? Yes. Um, I believe I remember I was just um, listening or reading about this where Amy Heckerling, who directed Wayne's World, I believe. She directed Clueless, uh, I think. Uh, and, and did she do, she might have done both, but, um, maybe, maybe, maybe Penelope's yours. Anyway, okay. Anyway, she was a, a very well known director and actually had hit on Chris Kattan and Chris Kattan wouldn't sleep with her. And then she eventually wound up leaving the movie for a, a variety of reasons. So yeah, it's not just confined to men, but I think it's fair to say it's overwhelmingly. <laughs> Uh, overwhelmingly confined to men. And then this raises very difficult questions because we're on blogging heads and because I, I, I really enjoy Robert Wright and his writing. This raises very difficult questions about is this quote unquote natural? Is it just because patriarchy is, is, uh, is a particular social system that forces this? Is, uh, is male sexuality inherently violent in a meaningful way or is it just culturally, uh, culturally pushed in that direction? And ultimately these are uh, very difficult to answer questions because you'll never have a, a true laboratory experiment to discover what male 
homosexuality, quote unquote, really is. But it does raise, raise, raise incredibly difficult questions about male sexuality. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next five, 10 years, a lot more academics begin focusing on this as both a philosophical and empirical problem. And, and, and what this says about not only in quote unquote inherent male sexuality, which I'm a little bit doubtful of because I'm a historian, but also the sort of culture of patriarchy and culture of capitalism working together, culture of racism, I might add, all of these things working together to, to, to lead to these particular results that, that leads to the, uh, the, not only the creation of a monster like Jeffrey Epstein, which one could individually psychologize, but also the creation of a, a support structure that allowed him to go on from probably at least the 1970s until essentially 2019 uh, doing what he what, what he's been doing. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I won't speculate on the, um, you know, evolutionary psychology of, of this. Um, although, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll leave that one be and maybe, maybe Bob Wright can, can pick it up at some point. Um, did, I mean, the, uh, a figure who we haven't mentioned who seems to play a major role with Epstein is, uh, this woman whose name is per- perhaps pronounced Gislan or Gislaine Maxwell. Yeah. Um, a, a, an English aristocrat? So the aristocracy is always is always bundled in. Yeah. Oh, and we should mention uh, Prince Andrew is one of the other friends of Epstein who has been accused of raping young women. Uh, Certainly no Jew, uh, Prince (laughs) Prince Andrew. So, but yeah, it's you know this woman is is like described as as Epstein's uh, girlfriend, but real, but maybe that was true, but also seems to be kind of the um, madam or or pimp of the procurer. uh, Yes, of the pander of the uh, operation, and yeah, I don't. I mean. I, I, she has not been arrested, as far as I know, and but it seems like she's she's deeply implicated in these crimes and is just a fascinating figure from the, you know, male versus female perspective of you know she obviously identified more with Epstein's needs and wants than the uh, desires and rights of the underage women who she was recruiting, um, right. and you know. I guess you could, you know, I'm sure there's women who, uh, thousands of women throughout history who have run brothels and did not really care that much about uh, what happened to um, the women under their charge. But yeah, no, but, well, it's, just, I, it's, it's very, like, I it's very it's, strange. It's just another strange. Wait, very, yeah, very, I think it's important not to equate sex work with what was going on. Just, just, I think that that's, that's sort of a slippage that a lot right, of people have true. been making. Uh, because so these, this okay, these, not these women sex. were under were under eighteen and couldn't consent yeah. legally to engage in uh, sexual activity with an adult. And although you know some of them, they kind of, I think there's a couple who kind of like stayed on for some length of time, you know, into sure. after they were legally adults and like traveled around with with Epstein and stuff, and then eventually they kind of like floated away. Um, but you know, they who knows how they were kind of like indoctrinated into this into this world and what they exactly thought. Um, you know, they, they could do to leave it. Um, but yeah, I mean, do you, do you think, I mean, okay, so something happened to Epstein like 48 hours after he was arrested where he either tried to kill himself or someone else assaulted him in jail. Was it a hit? Yeah. And that, and that was, when that happened, it was like, yeah, is this like something out of a movie? You know, did Hillary Clinton, the, the joke on, main joke on Twitter was like Hillary Clinton, you know, did it right. uh, because, you know, the right wing conspiracy is that the Clintons have like killed dozens of people over the years um, to silence their critics and, you know, maintain power. Um, but yeah, it is, there hasn't been, a, I, there hasn't, I, I don't think they've clarified what actually happened, whether it was an assault or whether it was a suicide attempt. Uh, hopefully they can realize that like, yeah, this guy's kind of like should be treated like a mob boss who's in jail, not just like a regular kind of sex criminal who's in jail and needs like maybe 24 hour supervision or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if he, yeah, if he had, if he had died that time, I, I, it, I mean, that just would have been crazy. And then all these, I guess that, you know, they raided his apartment and gotten all of his documents and stuff. Uh, but I, we could hope that there'll be like, a attestation of what actually happened and you know who who else was in on it i don't i don't know i don't know if we'll if we'll ever get that even if epstein does make it to trial alive yeah i mean it seems to be reasonable that he would try to kill himself and it seems to be uh reasonable also that targeted assassinations happen in prison so it's, it's difficult to know yeah uh yeah. Ex- exactly what happened it also seems reasonable that uh i remember reading somewhere i can't remember the source but all, aren't pedophiles also notoriously uh targets in prison as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think, I think there's, there's 
who knows? Uh, I think that's the truth. You know, it's very, very difficult to know. We might never know. Uh, but there seems to be a lot of reasonable possible situations that could explain why Epstein wound up injured 48 hours after he was arrested in prison. You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's very difficult to know. Um, it, it's, It'll be really interesting to see what actually comes out with all this, if anything comes out with it, you know, because as, as many people, many former blocking heads, guests, people like Glenn Greenwald have demonstrated, there's really a two tier justice system. Um, but when that doesn't really operate is when there's an enormous amount of public uh, attention being paid to a particular case. So, uh, I mean, I would guess it seems that Epstein has uh, information about lots of different, very powerful people. I mean, you saw Alan Dershowitz, you know, really freak out. Uh, uh, in anticipation of the New Yorker article that came out, and I imagine that what is going to further come out is not going to be particularly flattering to him or other people. I mean, who knows, but that seems likely to me. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the fallout, if any, there is uh, from this case. Uh, the New York media will continue to cover it, I think, uh, a, a ton. So I think th- this case will be with us for a while. Um is it going to go to trial? Is that where we're standing now? Or is um, he going to flee? I don't know. Um, I mean, this, yeah, yeah. it seems like I don't know who is representing him. Um, I, but it, I think it's going to it'll probably take like months, if not years, before any trial or plea would would happen because they're still gathering evidence. I assume other people like Maxwell right. will be arrested and um you know, gathering documents. The guy had houses, you know, had like six different houses, um, right. had an island with some sort of strange temple like building on it. Um, so, so does this make you question capitalism? <laughs> well, I, I mean, not, well, I, like I said, in some ways it makes me question, like, um, have a burn it all down feeling towards our elite and, you know, what they, what they value. But so they like. a better elite possible. That's the real question. Do you think under different circumstances, there could have been a quote unquote better elite? Uh, maybe, maybe, question. yeah, maybe somewhat. Um, uh, you know, I, if we, you know, the people who are connected to Epstein, who, uh, v- who various um, uh, young women have charged with uh, sexually assaulting them, like, I think we could assemble a, a greater <laughs> group of people than, than, than them. Um, you know, like if, if I, if I were invited onto the plane and, and the young women started coming out, like, I think I would be able to resist temptation, but, but I don't know. <laughs> you don't get to that position unless you're like that. That's the problem. You have to be rapacious to rise to the top of these industries. You have to be. That's, that's possibly, that's possibly true. I mean, you have to be like, I don't know if rapacious, I would say that, but you have to be like kind of ruthless and, you know, um, single-minded and yeah, you're like, when you're trading at a hedge fund, you're not exactly caring about like the people who are like, uh, you know, mopping the floors at the companies that you're, uh, causing the to suffering as business. a direct result of your trading. So I agree with that, but I don't, I guess I kind of, you know, I am in the, um, you know, what's the better system kind of thing. Like if, if, you know, if we imagine some different, uh, type of arrangement of society, uh, what would better elites rise, <laughs> rise to the top? Um, you know, do the, are there, were the people who are on like the, um, communist central committee, uh, were they a, a better type of person who wouldn't? That's uh, a problem with authoritarianism, not communism or communism defined as the egalitarian, uh, the egalitarian distribution of resources. I mean, if you, I mean, that's horrible. You need liberal principles. You need freedom of speech. You need freedom of assembly. You need all freedom of association, all of those things. I think the history of the 20th century shows is that authoritarianism under any guise, whether it's capitalist or communist, doesn't work. But the question of distribution of resources, which is, I think, really the fundamental one when we're talking about the political economy of capitalism, that to me is the question. Of course, the Communist Central Committee was absolutely horrible. You know, all of these horrible dictators are absolutely horrible. You know, no one, no one wants that. But to me, that's not really the question. Yeah. Well, I mean, right? if you, like, if you had a much, you know, if, 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 if it was, there's a question about whether Epstein was really a billionaire, but if you could say, okay, Epstein, you can't be a billionaire. The most you can get is like $15 million and then everything else will be taxed and taken yeah. away from you. Then, you know, you can imagine he would, you know, his personal morals, uh, would have, he, he could, uh, he couldn't put them into effect as as well because he couldn't buy the giant mansion to entertain the fifteen year old girls giving massages and all That's this kind of stuff. Really much, <laughs> but you still have, I mean, but you're still going to have people. 
you're still going to have people like at the top of any sort of system who could, sure, who could conceivably the, abuse their power. Yeah, sure, but it's the possible effect. Of course, the hierarchies seem to be something that most societies have. It doesn't necessarily have to be hierarchies of wealth. It could be hierarchies of status. It could be hierarchies of prestige. You know, for example, in, in Weimar, Germany, it was very prestigious to be a member of the military. It wasn't as prestigious to be a, a merchant, for example, right? There are different hierarchies. But I think the issue is when we're talking about organizing our society, whether uh, the allowing the uh, intense accrual and centralization of resources that allow one to manipulate every aspect of society makes any sense. To me, 15 million is far too much. No one should be worth that much more than anyone else, right? I mean, I think these are, these are actually first principle questions that that we haven't asked in this country in a very long time. How much more should one person be worth than another person? Right. That that's a fundamental first principle question. Right now we're saying that CEOs are what worth four thousand times, whatever it is, four hundred times, I don't know the exact number, mm-hmm. but orders of magnitude more than other people. And I think that's not just a question of political economy, but it's actually a question of philosophy. And what I hope is that the monsters like Epstein actually encourage us to return to those questions of first principle, which are, of course, even more important in an era of climate change, where we need to rethink things like consumption, right? You and I and most Americans have grown up in a world where we just consume, 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 consume. We're something like 4% of the world's population and we, t- we can, you know, consume most of the world's plastics or most of the world's paper or, 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 you know, all of these things. And these are really fundamental questions that are actually central to act, um, which are, which are central to capitalism as it really exists in the world that I hope that uh, as a society and as, as you know, People who talk in public, we really take the opportunities um, presented by cases like Epstein to rethink a lot of these fundamental problems because it very well may be that the existence of a lot of people depends on it in the next 50 to 100 years, which is a problem, one might add, but the gerontocracy that we have when so much of our political leadership is so old. I think the average age of a congressperson is something like 59. I mean, the, the, the world experiences of someone like that are just completely different from the world, uh, from, from the, the issue. They lead that, it leads them to ask questions that are not as relevant to the world in which uh, that is being created today. Now, it doesn't always work. For example, I'm a big Bernie Sanders supporter, and I think that he, uh, you know, is able to articulate an actually earlier version uh, of sort of, um, Social democracy or democratic socialism. I don't think there's actually that big a difference, but that's another discussion, uh, that people are, are uh, than, than most people are able to articulate today. But again, these are really fundamental questions that I think we, we really, really need to be asking. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let me add one more thing and then maybe we'll switch to our second topic. Um, so, you know, the fact that Harvey Weinstein was the head of his titular company and was a wealthy man with a lot of power certainly enabled him to continue his reign of a rape and sexual assault across across the decades and kept, you know, the women from reporting him to the cops because they knew it would ruin their careers, that kind of thing. Um, and if Harvey, if, if the janitor at the Weinstein company had tried to rape and sexually assault women in the same way, we can think it'd be at least more likely that he would have been uh, turned into the cops um, than, than, uh, than, Har- than Harvey Weinstein at the top. But under like a different distributional system of, uh, of resources, there's still going to be, if, if Hollywood still exists in this world and Hollywood production companies still exist, there's still going to be someone making the decisions and there's still going to be someone mopping the floors. And if the person making the decisions is... Not necessarily that. I mean, we could talk about that, about sort of like hyper labor specialization and sort of that whole thing. Um, and that might also be something that we want to reconsider uh, going forward, right? Sort of the, the hyper labor specialization might not be actually what allows human beings to reach their fullest potential. Um, so again, these are these are the way that I view it is we haven't had industrial modernity for that long, right? It's not even been 200 years. Mm-hmm. So there's been an explosive, exponential increase in the ability of human beings to one control their world, to transform their world, and three distribute resources, right? So we're very early on. And I just feel that in American political discourse, the imagination is so closed that what we can try to do is open it. So we don't necessarily have to say that there'll always be someone mopping the floors, 
right? That doesn't necessarily have to be the case, particularly given future technologies that are coming, right? So I think this is a moment for more and not less political imagination, I guess is, is basically what I'm saying, especially given the fact that the internet has essentially collapsed space and time. That as Jim Carrey said in The Cable Guy, we can play Mortal Kombat with our friend in Vietnam, right? And so I think <laughs> the, the, uh, these new possibilities really should should work to open our imaginations as opposed to close them is basically all I'm saying. Okay. And there'll be a lot of problems because human beings are going to create a lot of problems and there'll still be a lot of horror in the world. But I still think it could be better than what we have now, particularly if we organize a society around different principles. OK, I, I would I mean, just you know, to come back to it, like in so in the future world, uh, the toilets are still going to have to be cleaned. Maybe a robot will, will do it. Oh, or maybe <laughs> but, it's an enormous change. Yeah, but even you know, I there was what was there was some article or something that was about like, could you imagine uh, building a robot that would uh, fix your uh, washing machine if it broke instead of sending a person to fix it? And just like all the things that we don't possibly we don't currently know how to do, uh, we would need to figure out how to do in order to just create this one robot for this one task. Anyway, so so the robots could do it, but if the, if we don't have that technology, then it's going to be a person cleaning the toilet. And maybe uh, you can imagine a world in which like there's a big chore wheel at every company, and you know, and and it's the CEO's day to clean the toilets. Uh, one you know one day a month. Uh, that seems unlikely to me to ever happen, but uh, but who knows? Okay, but we so. Uh, Weinstein uh, is a link to our second topic, which is the uh, which is Quentin Tarantino, a longtime collaborator of um, of the Weinstein brothers, and his new movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is the first movie that he has made as director that that which uh, Weinstein was not attached to, and uh, and certainly Tarantino was like the emblematic figure attached attached to Weinstein and like the rebirth of indie sim- cinema in the nineties. So, um, so we both saw this movie and, um, so we'll talk about it in both a, a non-spoiler section and then a spoiler section towards the end. So if you haven't seen it yet, um, you can stop, uh, towards the end and, uh, and you won't get spoiled because there are, there are some spoilers in this movie. Uh, so, so I like this movie a lot and I think I'm liking yeah. it more, yep. even like looking back on it, like thinking about it, it's growing in my estimation. Kind of as as you're going through it, like not a lot happens for most of the movie. It's kind of like people talking, they're driving around, uh, they're watching movies, uh, they're making movies. But well, there is, I, I guess, there is one big fight scene in the middle. But aside from that, uh, it's, it's much less action than you know, Kill Bill or um, Pulp Fiction. Okay. And yeah. and also significantly less violent than than his other movies, though with the spasm of violence um, in one part. Uh, yeah, so I liked it, and I would recommend people go see it. Uh, if you like Tarantino, you'll like this. I think if you like either Brad Pitt or Leo DiCaprio, you'll like this movie. Uh, so, what did you think of it? Uh, I thought it was it was really interesting, and so there's been a lot of criticism about that uh, about the movie and a lot of discussion. And I'm just going to focus on what I could bring to it a, 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 as a historian and sort of the construction of historical memory. Uh, and what it really struck me uh, about is how much uh, it's a Gen X movie, uh, in the sense that uh, it, it really seems to me, um, and we could talk about why later on, but a rejection of hippie culture and an embrace of the so-called the greatest generation, right? About about what America's possibilities could be. Um, so as many people I'm sure are aware, growing up particularly in the 80s and 90s, there was sort of this uh, this entirety of 60s nostalgia, right, where, where sort of American civilization reached its apex, you know, the, the baby boomers solved all of our problems, uh, and then we were just going forward, and, and particularly in the 90s and history had ended because they had also defeated the Soviet Union. Um, and so what was really interesting to me in this movie is the complete rejection of um, of all of the emblems of baby boomer culture. Or, or particularly these particular emblems of baby boomer culture in the figures of um, Brad Pitt's character, Cliff Booth, and, and Leonardo DiCaprio's character, uh, Rick Dalton, who are absolutely presented as a protagonist, who are absolutely presented as the heroes, uh, and they totally reject um, baby boomer culture. But at the same time, um, where the movie goes is also a rejection of that which ended the baby boomer culture as well. So in some sense, it's a very tension filled movie because I, I mean, it's hard to talk about without spoilers, but it, it, it both embraces the sixties 
and rejects the 60s at the same time. And so I think there's a fundamental ambivalence toward this particular moment in American history, which I find really interesting coming from a director like Tarantino, who in his quote unquote third phrase has focused so much on historical revisionism. So I think that um, what I find so compelling about the construction of historical memory is this profound ambivalence about what the 60s means for the United States and for American culture generally, because there's absolutely a nostalgia for the pre sixties cowboy shows, quote unquote, real Americans, masculine, uh, masculine, um, figures. But these are also, um, and we could talk about how later, but Brad Pitt saves the sixties, right? <laughs> so what does that say? I think it's, it's a really tension filled and ambivalent argument. And I think Tarantino himself doesn't know what to feel about the 1960s, just like I think the culture itself doesn't know what to feel about the 1960s and the baby boomers themselves and Generation X themselves don't know what to feel about the 1960s. And it just seems to me like a movie a millennial would have never been able to make, right? Because <laughs> I think millennials are much less ambivalent about the 1960s. They know what's good and they know what's bad. But I think there's a nostalgia evident in, in the boomers and Gen X that that is really uh, unique and interesting. And perhaps we should just talk about sport i mean we should, we should say uh, yeah well let me so i i realized we for people who, who don't pay attention to movies we didn't even summarize what this movie is really about so it's sure. it was at when people were when it Sorry. first came out what that quentin, quentin tarantino was making this movie it was described as he's making a movie um about the manson family or the manson family murders and then people were like oh god quentin tarantino was making a manson family movie. oh god but it's really it's not that so it's not that because it's really it focuses on these imaginary characters um, a kind of washed up TV cowboy actor played by DiCaprio and his best friend, best friend and stuntman uh, played by Brad Pitt. And so DiCaprio is, you know, he used to star in a 1950s Western and that ended. And since then he's pretty much played the bad guy on TV, on TV Westerns. Uh, so he'll, he, so he's like the heavy and he'll come in and do an episode and then he gets killed at the end of the episode. And so he needs to find another job next time and um coincidentally these uh next his next door neighbor leo dicaprio's next door neighbor is uh sharon tate and roman polanski who just moved in and sharon tate is played by margot roby in a um a very uh, like it's a very interesting performance and people have critiqued it especially how it's written or not written yeah. because she doesn't have a I lot to say guided. she was amazing she she i mean acting is not just with words i, I it, it she was she, unbelievable. Yeah, she, yeah. She's a fantastic actress. She's probably like one of the best of, of her generation. Yeah, so she's an Itania yeah. and um Itania. And which is a very good movie. And yeah, so and well, so she I, like I you know, I didn't really know what Sharon Tate looked like before seeing this movie. And then there's a scene where um where where uh Roby as Sharon Tate goes to watch a movie that she was in, which is a uh Dean Martin like spy caper parody movie. And uh, you, so you see here in the, in the theater um, watching the movie and there's some playfulness throughout the movie where you see, you see like a scene where uh, a, a character is talking to, Di to DiCaprio and says, is it true that you uh, were almost cast in the great escape? Um, and then you see an image of the great escape where instead of, um, is it Steve McQueen? Is that, is that who's yeah. instead of Steve McQueen, yeah. it's Leo. He's there you know, in the, in the concentration camp or whatever, and is interacting with the other actors through CGI. Um, so there's been, so there's stuff like that throughout. And uh, then you, so then uh, Roby has uh, Tate is watching the movie and I thought they did the same thing, but actually that was, that was not altered. That was actually Tate. Uh, and that yeah. was, that was the real movie with Dean Martin. Uh, but the, the, the resemblance is such that you, uh, that I was fooled and thought, Oh, they're just doing the CGI thing once again so anyway so she looks like her she's and there was a quote from um sharon tate's sister saying that it, it was like you know she was revivified on screen and was bo moving and breathing like her and everything yeah so it's a great performance there's this, there's this great scene very early on where they go to a party at the playboy mansion and you yeah. see her like skipping in joy down to like the grotto with uh with i think mama cass and michelle phillips uh from the yeah. mamas and the papas and it's just like it was such a I, I found it such an affecting, like, just expression of pure joy and, like, the, like you have these beautiful people, like, <laughs> having s such innocent, great fun. And I was like, wow, this is, like, this is incredible. 
And then, yeah, so, but then she does, a lot of the movie is her, um, you know, walking around or driving places or watching herself on screen. So, so she doesn't have a lot of dialogue. The movie is, the, the bulk of the movie is really focused on uh, DiCaprio and Pitt's characters. And, um, and then they're kind of running with the, the Manson family at some point. Um, okay, so, so before we enter the spoiler section, do you have, any, do you have anything else you want to say? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, it's, I just, I, I thought the, the criticism of, of her and the, 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 the role she played was misguided. And I think once you see the movie, she, she, she carries the movie in a real sense. I mean, and, 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 and it's true that she doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but she has a lot of screen time and her presence, I think, is the, the purpose and, and sort of the ambivalence of the movie, which we could talk about now because what happens at the end, Aria? <laughs> okay. So that, so. So you know this is a Manson family movie. At one point, um, Brad Pitt's character kind of get, uh, picks up a hitchhiker, uh, this um, you know sexy eighteen-year-old girl, hippie girl who's has her thumb out. And uh, uh, where do you live? Uh, this place is Spawn Ranch, which is where they used to film westerns, and he knows it because he used to make movies there as a stuntman. So they go there, and uh, this very creepy, creepy scene of the uh, Manson family members hanging out and kind of acting weird. And he meets this um, uh, guy, the guy Spawn himself, who he knows from back in the day, who's played by uh, Bruce Dern, and yeah. he seems and he's like gone blind, and he's out of it. And so you think like, is, you know, are, are they going to like stick a knife in Brad Pitt's back at any moment or something? Um, but uh, and inter- interestingly, you you don't see Manson in that scene. You see Manson like for he's on screen for less than five seconds. It, it seems yeah. like and doesn't maybe utters like two lines of dialogue. And he is, so he is just a spectral presence in the movie. He's not, he's not on screen. And then, um, so then you're, you're like counting down and the movie makes it very explicit that like, this is the night of the murders. And what, what are all the people doing? The mundane things. There's a voiceover. That's uh, Kurt Russell doing the voiceover. All the mundane things that he was, um, that the virus. Characters... Her... No, it's Kurt, it's Kurt Russell. Cause, um, he, uh, oh. at least I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I don't think Tarantino that- is is on screen or is audio. No, no, but Tarantino does the voiceover. I thought, but I don't. I th- I don't yeah, know I think it is the Russell character who was the stunt coordinator character um, on the on the film that you know tossed um, the Brad Pitt character. So, so there, yeah. So there's a countdown. You know, what are they doing? And this is, this is all historically accurate for the characters who are real people. And then you see the Manson family, the four members of the Manson family uh, who committed the uh, Tate murder. You know, drive up in their car. And they're parked outside, and um, and uh, Leo's character comes out uh, because he hears this junky old car making a lot of noise, and he like and he like goes off on them, and is like, "You dirty fucking hippie, get your fucking car off my street!" And um, sends the and they're they're scared of him, and and they and sends them packing, um, so they go back down to the bottom of the street, and so this is so the, here's where you know so here's where historical revisionism comes comes in, and uh, one of them. Um, runs runs off. Um, and th- I, did you uh, realize that that uh, the act that actress who's on screen for like three minutes is um, the daughter of Uma Thurman and Ethan Hawke? And isn't the, one of the other Manson members a daughter of Pamela Adlon? That's possible. Is, there's a, there's a, there are multiple a women. This movie again problem with capitalism. But yeah, yeah, there are multiple. There, I think actually it must have been a conscious choice because the hippie who picks up or who is thumb is thumbing and Brad Pitt picks up is the daughter of Andy McDowell. And, right. Um, it's all these children. Yeah, yeah it's Kevin a little... Smith's but... daughter is, is in it as well. There's one or two others. It's, it's weird. It must have been on purpose. Um, so, but that's Tarantino's like subliminal statement. So anyway, so she runs away. There's only three now. And they decide, hey, isn't that... That's the guy from that TV show. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, they're the ones who taught us how to be violent. Like uh, the 50s Western movies taught us how to be violent. Like, let's let's go to them instead. Um, because the reasons... I, I, I don't know that... I don't know this super well, but like the reasons for killing the people who are in, you know, the Polanski mansion were not like ideological or made sense in any logical way. It was something like this was a house that Manson had, had some association with. Terry Melcher used to live there and he was involved with this guy through the music business. That's, and then he Melcher, I believe rented the house to Polanski and tape. It was, it was, it was a, you know, a weird way of random killing. Um, Slightly. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. It's not like they were going to go k- kill Sharon Tate. Um, right. So, so then they said, "Well, let's let's get them instead. Let's get uh, or let's get uh, Leo DiCaprio instead." 
And so they go, go back up. And, uh, DiCaprio is <laughs> floating in his pool on a floaty device and listening to uh, music or something with headphones. And Brad Pitt is there. And... It's just like Snoopy and the Red Baron, right? Oh, is he? That's funny. I didn't catch that. Yeah. yeah so think... As with any Tarantino movie, there's lots of like cultural references that you probably need to <laughs> watch multiple times. And Brad Pitt has just smoked an acid-dipped cigarette. And... Um, which isn't real, which won't get you high, apparently. <laughs> yeah, I saw that, too. I said, like, it would just disintegrate because it is acid. Um, so he is experiencing reality in a strange way. And then the the three uh, killers come in and say, like, you know, we're going to, like, they have guns and knives and shit. And then... Um, they use the actual the line, which is something like, I'm the devil here to do the devil's business. They use what they actually said. Right. So yeah. then... Um, Brad Pitt kills them all, and with a little help from DiCaprio, in a very violent, over-the-top, almost cartoonish kind of way, uh, he has a, pip, a beloved pit bull named Brandy who uh, attacks the uh, attacks the male killer and you nice know, rips his uh, penis off or something, and uh, he smashes he, he smashes a can of dog food into the face of one of the women, and her face is, is like smashed in a way that I hope is not how human faces were smashed because it looked cartoonish, but maybe it maybe it is, and then. Uh, the piece de, resist- piece de resistance is that uh, DiCaprio has was in a World War II movie where he used a flamethrower to kill a bunch of Nazis, and they let him keep the flamethrowers, so it's in his, you know, like a banner room, and he takes it out and fries uh, the third the third one um, in a you know righteous uh, righteous act of uh, purifying flame or something like that. And okay, so so Sharon Tate and her friends were not killed. They didn't even r- really know what was happening. And the movie ends where, um, yeah, so Pitt has gotten stabbed and he gets um, taken to the hospital. They say how they're, you know, it's, it's great to have a friend or something like that. And uh, the DiCaprio washed up actor is invited up to meet Sharon Tate. And it's kind well, of just one quick thing. Yeah. So basically DiCaprio had fired Pitt's character and it implies that that is no longer the case. Right. After so it's not only it's not only their friend they've restored their relationship and also saved the sixties and then Sharon Tate invites DiCaprio up and they all get a drink together and this is what DiCaprio's character wanted to do because he wanted to be be in the next Polanski movie because Polanski had just directed Rosemary's Baby I believe in sixty eight right. but so anyway so what 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 I was getting at earlier is that essentially you have um, Brad Pitt and Leo DiCaprio the anti sixties people saving what was good about the 60s. And so I think this is a really ambivalent position uh, about what Tarantino thinks about this whole cultural moment in American history. And it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing, right? So I guess the idea is that you'll save the good parts of the 60s, you know, the free love, the, the hippiness, the sort of, you know, beauty of, of Sharon Tate as you destroy sort of the dark undercurrents of the sort of the racism, of course, because the Manson family wanted to incite a race war. Right. So you, you destroy the, you murder the racism of the 60s by a character who, you know, based on his, social positioning as you know a 45 to 50 year old white man veteran in uh, southern california of the late 60s who had come up in the 50s was probably himself you know of, of somewhat racist bent particularly in the in the scene earlier uh, another spoiler where he gets in a sort of a contest fight with bruce lee and you know is a little being a little dismissive and a little racializing of the bruce lee character calling him kato because he was on the green hornet i believe <laughs> right. and Issue. So there's a lot of mixed messages going on um, with the historical revisionism, which I, it's pretty interesting. It's a pretty rich text. I would yeah, say. I don't. I don't think there's a single message that he's trying to get across. And I, I agree. There's a lot of ambivalence. Um, and I mean, it's in a way like um, Tarantino pulled this stunt before in a much more spectacular way in um, in Glorious Bastards, which yeah. which I think is his masterpiece. And it's amazing. When I was watching in the theater the first time, was like, you know, it becomes clearer and clearer that they're getting close to killing Hitler. And then I was like, well, how? What are they going to do? Like, it's clearly, the, like they, they can't kill Hitler. Like, we know that Hitler didn't die. And then they do it, and they not only kill him, they like shoot machine guns into his face, so you know, it turns into a, a bloody pulp. And it's this great moment of that. The whole ending of that movie is just this moment of like, yeah, the, like the a statement that like art can triumph over the disasters of history and 
um, you know, it's a moment of Jewish revenge over the Nazis that, you know, the Jews never got. And it, yeah, and just an incredible piece of, of filmmaking. So, so changing history and killing, killing bad guy, um, in which Brad Pitt is involved, like he's, he's done that one before, and this is on a smaller scale. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't see it coming exactly, but once you see them start, like, once you realize that they're like heading to confront DiCaprio and, um, and Pitt instead of, uh, Sharon Tate, you like, you know, you don't, you know, something is, is different, but I, I did think it worked. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, this, the movie overall had like fewer kind of like tricks and postmodern effects than a lot of his other work. It was more, it was kind of more straightforward, even though you had historical revisionism, you had a uh, voiceover coming from nowhere. You had those scenes where they're making, where they're filming the movie, uh, or filming the TV show that are shot in this very unusual way. So that it seems like, it's being shot like a modern picture, but the the director, you don't, the director and the cameras are not there. So it's this kind of like imagined view of, of what's happening in yep. this, um, sixties like, Western. This awesome, this awesome thing, which is clearly crap. And a lot of people I think have commented on the fact that, you know, Tarantino's basically showing that things that we consider to be of low, low culture are actually, you know, have, have real craft behind yeah, them. I mean, he's been, that, yeah. He's been doing that. Doing that that's doing the thing. The Gen, very <laughs> Gen X. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, you know, the, Kill Bill was uh, was an homage to you know like B uh, martial arts films from the sixties and seventies and yeah he's been doing this kind of stuff for a long time and bringing I mean bringing Travolta back in the um, yeah. in Pulp Fiction was was an act of like you know saving uh, Gen X or saving a washed up boomer um, so yeah so I think it's you know it's 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 worth watching I think a lot of people were were coming into it being like okay so I mean. The different things are different. If this movie had been released four years earlier or something, I think we would view it differently. There's the Weinstein connection. Right. There's the there's the reporting or the uh, interview that Uma Thurman gave about uh, having to perform a dangerous stunt on the set of Kill Bill that gave her um, a very severe injury, um, and that she felt like she was you know pressured into into doing this and wasn't wasn't taken care of, um, and yeah, and and just the like. And the, the the ambivalent way that Tarantino treats women on screen is actually an interesting article that uh, we'll link to that is called uh, – it was in BuzzFeed by Allison Wilmore, A History of Women in Quentin Tarantino f- Movies. She looks at eight different characters from the um, – from Tarantino's movies and kind of – through a, so, both a, like a kind of a cinematic and feminist lens and I think points out that like – you know, you could say – he. Just to say, like Quentin Tarantino hates women, he's canceled, is way too simplistic. And, you and this to... gets into our old argument about aesthetics and ideology, right? <laughs> and how it's not so easily to impose an ideological perspective on aesthetics. I mean, I think that, that that's very clear. And I think it, again, it's misguided to quote unquote either say that Robbie doesn't give a, an incredible performance or that Sharon Tate is 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 not the what I would probably say the most important character in the movie, uh, but also to quote unquote cancel. Tarantino in this simple way. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's there's things that can be criticized in how he portrays women, and also things yeah. things that can be Ooh. praised. And um, which is is really if you watched Pulp Fiction recently, the whole the Bonnie situation, it's it's it, it not boggles the, past the mind. Ten, ten years or so. <laughs> yeah, That's the Bonnie situation it boggles the mind. Uh-huh. It, there there's no character purpose really. It's just. There's a lot going on there, I think, personally, and that the fact that Tarantino made himself play the this racist, horribly racist character is very interesting. Um, there's a lot going on there, so I think there are certainly problems with Tarantino. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, a, a real brilliant—I don't like the word genius because I think it individualized—but a br- clearly a super talented person um, <laughs> aesthetically, you can't just dismiss the whole oof. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, he's, um, you know. When, when people were like, there's a new Tarantino movie coming out, like who else at this state of, you know, Hollywood where like people say there's a new Avengers movie coming out. They don't say there's a new, whoever the hell, Russo. the Russo brothers or whatever, whoever the hell directed those movies. Like it's not, you know, he, he is kind of maybe the last auteur who's working within the Hollywood system still. And right. it, it's, and his, his movies do have a vision. Um, and I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to think who exactly, I mean, maybe, um, so is he, Maybe. Yeah, Scorsese, Not... obviously, he's kind of, you know, on his way out, and he has a strange movie that's coming out on Netflix in which the, the Nero Spielberg, is... I mean, all the de-aged. boomer generation, basically, 
all, there's some boomer, you know, you have Spielberg, you have Scorsese, Coppola did probably, but there's very few people after that. You know, I mean, if Tarantino came up with Kevin Smith, right? Those were the two big Miramax directors and no one cares about Kevin. Smith. Although they're, they're, they made a new, they're making a new or they did make a new um, Jay and Silent Bob movie, which yeah. I don't know. I had, I had a deep connection to Kevin Smith as a teenager uh, growing yes, up in New Jersey. Of course. Um, yeah. I went to Red Bank. I get it. <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, I went to, I went to uh, Red Bank as well. And, but yeah, they, I think they all just kind of look too old to be still <laughs> doing this stuff, um, at this stage. But yeah, I'll, I'll probably end up seeing that anyway, just out of nostalgia's sake. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I think I would recommend, so, I mean, the movie has been spoiled if you haven't seen it already, but it still has a lot of pleasures. It's not just like a Netflix. twist movie, like, you know, it looks great. The acting, the three leads, the acting is great. And you see all these, and there's a lot of just, uh, you know, not, maybe not A-list exactly, but a lot of, uh, prominent people appear in this movie for a very short period of time and they do a good job. Lena Dunham is in it. I was on screen for like three minutes. All the, you know, Rumor Will- Willis and all these uh, second generation actors, the uh, Damian Lewis, the guy from Homeland is, is on there for like two minutes playing Steve McQueen. And, yeah. um, Perry, Luke Perry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, this is Luke Perry's final, <laughs> um, final uh, movie. He was, he filmed, um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's really yeah. good. Apparently, <laughs> it's good. I just want to work with Tarantino. Who guessed? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I actually must go. Okay. My, yeah. My I time. think we're at a natural stopping point. Anyway, so Daniel, um, people can follow you on Twitter. And what is your what is your Twitter account? Uh, D Bessner at D Bessner. Okay, and I am and at. I- book Democracy in Exile. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of Jay Sherman. Remember, buy my book. Buy my book. <laughs> Buy my book. <laughs> and I, yeah, check it. So check it out. And I am at um, A-R-Y-H-C-W on Twitter. Uh, so thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, thank you to our viewers and listeners, and we'll see you again next time. Godspeed.